Hello, my name is Jorge Ramos and in this video I'll be talking about the use of arm weight in piano technique to develop a deeper understanding of this type of movement that we use uh, in piano performance. Throughout the video I'll explain the pedagogical benefits of the use of arm weight as well as its origins, why we started to use the arm weight in piano technique, who started it, and its pedagogical evolution throughout the ages uh, since it was created until nowadays. So I decided to pick this topic and talk about it because I've always been passionate about the way in which the greatest pianists have used the arm weight technique. Uh, I always have loved the way in which the piano sounds, the, the resonance and the color that the piano gets when pianists use this great technique. Uh, back then, when I was 16 years old, I didn't have the resources to find out and research why, why, why pianists started to use this. So I thought this would be the perfect moment to uh, dig into it and, and explore the, the different ways in which it evolved. We begin our journey in the history of arm weight technique with one of the greatest pianists of the 19th century, if not the best pianist of the 19th century, Franz Liszt. Um, Franz Liszt started to incorporate this huge change of dynamics and colors because he saw the evolution of the piano, the technological developments that started to happen in, in the 19th century, the increase of the size in the piano, the iron frame, the double uh, speed, the, the response of the keys was faster, so he started to take advantage of these new technological developments and started to, to incorporate these, these ideas that he had of having a wider sound, having a, a different types of textures and colors in, in his piano playing. So also the, the idea of the pianist as a soloist uh, encouraged him and helped him to integrate this technique of the arm weight. It is important to mention that Liszt also started performing in bigger halls where crowds of 500, 1,000, 1,500 people would come to hear him. So he needed to project the sound in bigger halls. So he needed to find new resources in his body and his playing to fill out the sound in wider halls. In his first piano concerto, we can already witness the dynamic adjustments that Liszt had to do in order to fill out the sound in bigger halls and to compete in a way with the sound of the orchestra, which by the way was growing at the time. observing the best pianists of the time, published uh, an article called The Armed Sufferings of the Pianist. His philosophy was based on focusing, general relaxation, the use of the arm weight, greased motion, and a preference for curved movements. Um, for the first time, we find the renouncement to the idea of an independent finger that was highly discussed uh, at the beginning of the 1800s and the middle of the 18th century. Uh, he believed on the use of the arm uh, as a free fall, letting the arm falling free, 
And in this uh, article he says, he says next, My way of producing the sound is not developed through heating, but exclusively using the weight of the hand with simple movements of rising and falling executed with the fingers still and relaxed, which is, in a way, a bigophony. The sound that is achieved is not just more refined, but more intense in character and generates a more penetrating sonority. It is not the result of a muscular action more or less forced, being that it is formed in the most complete repose and without any interior or exterior excitation, by which we could define as conscious unconsciousness. One of uh, Ludwig Depe's uh, student, Elizabeth Calland, she, she understood the philosophy of Depe as using the shoulder to guide the arm, so the motion coming from the shoulder and the back muscles in the pictures that I'll be showing you. We see her exploring these, these different exercises of completely rising the arm and exploring those muscles in the back, how they intervene in the way we, sh uh, we produce the sound. Um, he also believed that the height of the bench influenced tension. So, he would ask the students to, to put the bench uh, further down so the elbow would be in, in repose, like there's a natural repose of the arm. Uh, he also believed in orienting the gravitational center of the hand, alignment of the arm into the hand. Um, he also said very advanced, this is, this is a something that we'll find out in Alan Fraser, uh, one of the pedagogues of the 21st century. Um, the idea of strongly curving of the fingers to have a better support of the weight of the arm. And he also believed in the, in the elevation of the wrist so that any movement of the arm could be directly transmitted to the tip of the fingers. And lastly, he encouraged his students to pay uh, attention to the sound produced through the movement. So, some students would, would describe their lessons with him just paying careful and extreme attention to, this, to the sound instead of just mechanically playing and playing through the notes, he would encourage the student to listen carefully. To the production of the sound. We'll explore is Theodor Leszczytski, who was a student of Czerny. He became one of the most famous pedagogues in 1878 and he didn't have a rigorous method. He adapted his teaching to the individual characteristics and needs of his students, which I find fascinating. Franz Liszt also believed and adapted his thoughts uh, to the characteristics and needs of his students. Um, the pianistic action of his school was marked from the beginning to the end in the muscular activity, trying to avoid the stiffness of the wrist, as we will see in the video of Padereski. He believed in the use of the forearm to help weak fingers like the fourth and the fifth, which uh, years ago were just trying to be developed independently just by raising the, the fingers and that this created a lot of tensions. Um, he also, it, it is, it, what I found interesting is that he believed in the avoidance of pressurizing after depressing the keys used on so, if he would play a chord, he didn't believe in having the stiffness of the wrist. Therefore, he, he believed in a bouncing activity of the wrist, which will create uh, a bigger sound and also it would encourage relaxation. As, as Paderewski, in, in, in his 
piano playing Paderewski was one of his students, he, you can see that he was using a lot of this flexibility in the wrists. revolutionary treatises that has been written in piano technique is the one written by Breithaupt in 1912 called The Natural Piano Technique, Die Natürliche Klavier Technique. So uh, he mentioned that he was inspired by Liszt, although he was very young. Uh, he said that he remembered uh, Franz Liszt playing with a total relaxation of the muscles and the articulations. He said he used in its totality the weight of the whole arm and he used rotation and extension of the arm. Uh, Liszt played with his fingers long and extended with a passive fall from the hand. He moved his hands from the arms with an easy and loose movement. He avoided any rigidity or resistance in the joints. As we will observe in Claudio Arau's video, which uh, was a student of a student of Breithaupt, he incorporated this uh, elongation and flattening of the fingers in order to create a rich sound and warm uh, tone. Instead of completely curving the fingers, he would flatten and, and dig deep 
into the keys to create a very warm tone. One of uh, Breithaupt's uh, pedagogical applications of the weight was letting the student unload the weight of the arm in the teacher's hand. So he would put the palm of his hand and the student will, will, would um, unload the weight of the arm and Breithaupt would verify if the student would be completely relaxed by just feeling the, the, the weight of, of the arm in the palm of his hand. He also said that the more relaxed the muscles are, the louder the sound will be, which makes total sense. Um, his theories were based on physics, so if you look uh, at his method, you will, you will see a lot of these physics and this interest of applying the physics, the, the laws of physics and gravitation into piano playing. And he also believes in the equal distribution of the finger uh, weight to create a, a beautiful legato line. So now let's observe some examples of Claudio Arau's performances. He based his idea of tone production in the mental representation of sound from the performer. Uh, I actually disagree with this idea because in my personal experience I've encountered frustration when I try to match the mental representation that I have of sound with the one that is actually produced. So if I'm thinking of some very beautiful uh, warm color and I play the, the key, so most of the time I won't get that result because I'm so obsessed with matching this idea that I have in my mind. So I, I think this would, could create a lot of frustration in, in students if we try to ask them to match this mental representation of sound. He believed that the body will automatically, would automatically follow that mental representation and he also didn't believe in finding beauty of tone through the specific use of body movements. And finally we come uh, to Alan Fraser who is a pianist, a pedagogue, and he refined the ideas of arm weight brilliantly. In his book he says uh, weight in free fall is most free but is also most dead and I completely agree with this because what he's saying that is that if we let just weight of the arm drop we don't have any support of the fingers so there should be an activity a muscular activity of the fingers that is responding and it's uh, catching and he's, it's, he's in a way enriching the use of the arm weight. We can observe more of his ideas in this video. Arm, the weight of the arm. The weight of the arm is not, the, the hand does not experience the, the weight of the arm as an attack. The hand experiences the weight of the arm as a delicious kind of imposition. And, and the, the weight of the arm comes in and then the hand can gloriously stand up. <laughs> And the weight of the arm comes in and encourages the hand to stand up even greater. And it's just, it's this glorious sort of uh, co 
cooperation between the parts. But it, that's just another way of saying the, the, the strong fingers are the sine qua non of arm weight technique, as, as Al, Claudio Arau said. So, and of course, fingers do have their individual part to play. And so, this, the way that the arm is sensed, but the fingers have a resilient response to that. They, it's like they carry the weight of the arm. It's almost, it's a, it's a joy to them. It's, it's a great pleasure to them to have, you know, the capacity and the privilege of carrying the weight of that arm. And the weight of the arm consequently warms up the sound. I believe that arm weight uh, technique can foster and increase relaxation in our students if properly instructed. Uh, in my personal experience, I've observed uh, an increase uh, in relaxation and an increase of volume and, and richness of tone with this, this approach of relaxing my arms into my plane. So, if we're having students that need to develop uh, a bigger sound, I would uh, encourage you and into applying these principles that we've been discussing throughout this video. For further information, you can uh, refer to the bibliography that I've included in this video. Thanks for watching.